I'd like to welcome everyone to the Bunky Clinic Virtual Visiting Professor Series. Um, I am delighted uh, tonight to welcome a very dear friend of ours here at the clinic, Dr. Mike Zen, uh, President of Zen Plastic Surgery and Adjunct Faculty at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. Um, this is a, a bit of a bittersweet lecture because we actually were supposed to host Dr. Zen in person here at the Bunky Clinic back in May. Um, and we had everything planned out. Rudy Buntik, my partner and I, along with Dr. Greg Bunky and all of our partners had dinners uh, planned and everything, but unfortunately we all know what happened. And I assured Dr. Zen that tonight's lecture is certainly not in the place of an in-person visit, it's just gonna be in addition to. So we are greatly looking forward to having Dr. Zen visit us in person, uh, hopefully, hopefully soon. Uh, by way of a, a very brief background, um, Dr. Zen, obtained his BA from the U University of Pennsylvania, followed by his MD at Cornell University Medical College. Um, Someone more recently, he obtained an, his MBA from uh, uh, Duke at the Fuqua School of Business. His general surgery training was at the New York Hospital, Cornell Medical Center in New York, um, followed by plastic surgery at MGH and in Boston, and followed by microsurgery at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City. Um, as we know, Dr. Zen spent many years at Duke University. He was professor of surgery and plastic surgery there. He was also vice chief of the division of plastic surgery there um, uh, from 2009 to 2016. He was also program director in the division of plastic surgery for both the integrated and the independent track. Um, he ran the Duke FLAP course along with Scott Levin for many years at Duke. And more recently, he has been the co-director of the Penn FLAP course and of I um, had the privilege, along with uh, Rudy Buntik, my partner, of, of, of uh, going there last year, which was a tremendous, tremendous time. Dr. Zen is um, very, very heavily involved in, in most of our national societies in our field, um, has committee memberships in ASRM, ASPS, and the Plastic Surgery Foundation. He's, he's been involved in ACGME, the association, ACAPS, um, uh, the American Board of Plastic Surgery, as well as WSRM. So really someone who has dedicated um, much of his time in leadership positions in um, the premier societies within our field. And I think uh, perhaps um, uh, kind of most enjoyably, he is um, really responsible, the man responsible for, I think one of the, the highlights, if not the highlight of the SRM meeting every year, which is the best case, best save competition. Uh, this is by far the, the best attended um, session and it really showcases some of the talents of, of our members. And I think Dr. Zen is the person that we have to thank for that. Um, Mike, thank you so much for being with us. It's really an honor to have you. Um, and again, we can't uh, can't wait to have you here in person, uh, but I think in the, in the meantime, we decided that it's nice to have you virtually at least. Me too, thank you so much. All right, I'm gonna make you a presenter now and then uh, you should be able to share your desktop with us. Well, um, I can't tell you how honored I am and that was a beautiful introduction. My mom would be so proud to hear all that. I may have to have her watch the virtual uh, replay of that. Um, but no, so honestly, and uh, in all seriousness, um, we're a small knit community in uh, microsurgery, and uh, what we do is super special. And when you asked me to give a lecture, thinking about what message I'd wanna give to the fellows and the residents and those who are coming up in the field, um, I thought of this title, uh, one-offs in microsurgery and one-offs in the joy of microsurgery. Because um, I think it was very typical of my career in microsurgery and I think it may be very typical of many careers. Although I don't really have any disclosures for this talk, um, I feel like that I have uh, dedicated my life to education uh, and educating those in the field of uh, reconstructive surgery uh, through textbooks, apps, uh, online presence, uh, doing videos, and and also still working with some uh, companies, working with ICG and visualization for perforator flaps, and and working uh, on with companies for ADM. So, still feel like I and have my hand in reconstruction and teaching. And it's amazing how these types of virtual events and streaming things on video have really become the way that our students learn, and they're really lucky. You know that this education is hard to come by. Uh, in the old school of sitting back with three or four attendings, that's all you ever did, and that's all you ever read. So I, I liked your introduction of, of where I was. I, I throw this out. It's just always interesting to see how people change uh, during their years uh, after um, my general surgery training, which is five years. My sort of 30-year journey in plastic surgery started off at the Mass General Hospital. 
which was an incredible experience. Um, there were only two two residents uh, per year, and your first year you worked with all the greats, uh, the big names in plastic surgery. And your second year, you were on your own and had your own service, and uh, it was real uh, crucible. Where you really you were thrown in uh, with really difficult cases and really had to try to figure things out. So. That was phenomenal, but I think it was the era of microsurgery where kind of like just getting a piece of tissue to survive in an area where we were doing reconstruction was all that really mattered. And all that, uh, and all that was, that was a successful uh, case. It wasn't until I went to Sloan Kettering and I did the microsurgery fellowship with David Hidalgo uh, that I saw what really the artistry of plastic surgery was all about. Uh, for those of you who don't know David, he is not only a phenomenal microsurgeon, he is a phenomenal artist as well. And in fact, um, probably the reason that I went into plastic surgery uh, was thanks to David. As part of our general surgery, we would rotate across the streets of Sloan Kettering and doing a month on the microsurgery service and just seeing the first free fibula flap and seeing him spend countless hours, but forming a beautiful jaw and rebuilding a jaw from a free fibula just blew me away and I was hooked. Um, so my first job after fellowship uh, was at UNC uh, in Chapel Hill. And it was probably an ideal place uh, for, for a person to start. Um, they had one plastic surgeon, uh, his name was Jerry Sloan. All I did was kids. There was nobody doing really anything. There was nobody doing microsurgery. And so I literally got to do everything. Um, GYN cases, head and neck, orthopedics, you name it, everything we do in plastic surgery. I had a pretty active hand practice at that point also. And uh, life was good. You can almost see from the pictures. If you look at me at Mass General and Sloan Kettering, you know, thin, gaunt, tired, and then suddenly at UNC, I kind of just like exploded all that good North Carolina food and, you know, getting a little more sleep, uh, but working hard. And I was at UNC for about four years, four and a half years, and then was recruited over to Duke by a fellow named Scott Levin, uh, who you all know. And Scott was probably my most important uh, mentor and dear friend in plastic surgery. Scott is one of the most motivational people you ever meet and really got me on track uh, academically and also doing uh, just amazing cases. And as um, uh, Bob alluded to, you know, we did some really great things together, starting uh, the Duke Flop course uh, together, which was just a phenomenal, phenomenal experience. And uh, all the other things that we did in, in running the human tissue lab and um, training residents. So that's been sort of my 25 to 30 years uh, in academics. And one of the things I think that sort of typified my career was that I was doing so many different things and I felt like I was a really good microsurgeon. It's just that I never really accumulated large numbers of cases in any one area. And I would do really cool cases, but you can't get really cool cases published. And there's like not a lot, you know, a lot of my friends who were doing only deep flaps or only other, only other types of reconstructions were publishing and I felt I was falling behind a little bit. But like I said, it really kind of typified my career and it's actually a really fun part of our career. So if we define kind of one-off cases, you think about something that's just really unusual, something really unique, maybe something that you only do once, kind of a one-off. I can tell you that these cases are the ones that push you and they're really the ones that you never ever forget. And the other thing that I learned is that everybody loves talking about these cases because you know something, we all have these cases that no one really knows about that we do, which, brings us to the best case, best save, because in 2006, Scott Levin uh, was uh, the president of ASRM and he asked me to be the program director. And, you know, in looking for something out of the ordinary to do uh, as an event, I thought about my career and I thought about, we have all these great cases, we should just have like a best case competition and let people kind of show what they have. And I think one of the reasons that it's so popular and one of the reasons why people really enjoy it is because this is what we do on a daily basis. We're getting thrown in a situation we feel like you have the skills to solve the problem, but what's the answer to the problem? And it really draws in your creativity and it really draws you out as a plastic surgeon and a microsurgeon to do amazing things. And we're always blown away by these cases because we can imagine being there. We can, and we've been there. And all the, the source and all the suffering and, and everything we put ourselves through uh, to sometimes to finish these cases and get them done successfully. It's just amazing. So that was kind of the basis of this was kind of like basing it off my career and, and doing these one-off cases and just sharing them. And of course we have um, some distinguished winners. So I would certainly be remiss if I didn't mention that in 2012, Rudy uh, won the best case with 
one of the most beautiful Lippert constructions I've ever seen using a free innervated gracilis slab. Go figure, who, who would have known? And uh, just a fantastic case. And then Bobak in 2019 um, with his uh, save of a very difficult penile reconstruction case. And for those of you who have seen these presentations, you know, a lot of it is in the telling. It's the storytelling. But I think that's what we love, you know, uh, telling the stories of our patients and the cases that we do. So this is a talk that's geared uh, toward the fellows in the audience and the residents. And in thinking about this, I was thinking about kind of my own career. And I feel like there are different phases of your career in microsurgery. And once you kind of leave the nest of your fellowship, and the cases seem to go so easily, and you feel like you can do anything, you kind of are thrown into a situation where it's really on you. And it's super critical to get on base and to just solve the problem and not have a problem. My first case in practice at UNC, they had been saving for me, was a really difficult uh, jaw reconstruction that required a full-on Hidalgo uh, mandible reconstruction. And man, like you don't want that as your first case when you start practice. It's just so much pressure because everybody hears about this guy who's gonna come and do these cases and, and you don't know who's your friend, who's your enemy, what's going on. And uh, thank God that it worked out and uh, the case went really well. And I got my first introduction uh, to being in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. I was coming from New York City for my fellowship. And it was 11 o'clock at night. It was, it was a really, really long case. And so the guy who did the, re the resective surgery with me, we said, let's go grab a beer. And everywhere was closed. There was nowhere open in North Carolina, in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And I said, dear God, I have landed on a foreign planet. Because in New York, I'm certainly used to everything being up all night. Getting on base, super important. And really, your, your emphasis is on the technical aspects of these cases, making sure your pedicle lengths are the right, making sure your flap's the right size, you know, making sure you're getting faster and faster and better and better at your cases. And I think the critical thing in the first few years is to really do as many cases as you can. And um, you know, it is different than when you're in your fellowship. And you really start to become comfortable with being in a situation where something unexpected happens or the flap isn't what you thought it would be or happens frequently, especially in head and neck cases where you had your plan, you knew exactly what you're going to do and you go in and they end up resecting a whole lot more or your flap has some variant of anatomy and you can't use it or something. And all of us experienced microsurgeons actually feel really comfortable with that. But it's a hard, it takes a while. And I would say it took me a solid 10 years before I was never worried walking into any case, even cases that I hadn't done before because I knew I'd be able to figure it out. And it didn't mean that all my flaps survived. It didn't mean that when I did a take back that we weren't always able to save the flap. But I was always super positive about it. I think it's because those first formative years. And then after that, I think your shift, your, your focus on the cases changes. So I think when you're confident that the micro is not the issue anymore, it's not about flaps really surviving. It's about doing the cases and You've learned so much over that time. I feel like sometimes when you're advanced in microsurgery and you're trying to teach a fellow or a resident who's a beginner, it's kind of hard because a lot of the things that you're doing that make you so much more successful are things that are hard to teach because you can't even put words to them. Uh, it's just things you just know by doing it. And sometimes this is why we feel like the most junior faculty sometimes is the best person uh, to teach things uh, to a resident. We say it's because they're close in age, but it's really because it's a different level of learning. The thing that I found most rewarding though is that these cases are more than just technical. They're more than just solving the problem. It's you are actually an artist. Um, there's a very famous saying that these cases, you know, they're not science projects, they're actually art projects. Um, and I think, you know, for a lot of the cases that I was doing in microsurgery, which are facial reconstructions, uh, you know, breast and, and trunk reconstructions, a lot of it was like the artistry of getting it to look natural and look beautiful. Um, different than some of the other micro like with hand and other areas but it's about being an artist. And also what you begin to realize, and this was sort of my sort of pathway into anatomy and teaching more anatomy, doing work with perforators uh, about ICG and looking at blood flow and flaps is that you realize how unique each person's anatomy is and that you can write a textbook and tell somebody how to do a flap, but you need to know a lot more than that. That's, and oftentimes that is not really reflected uh, in what you see in your patient in front of you. And that's okay. And you can begin to be very comfortable with that. And what I what I truly believe is when you when you find the unexpected, when you do something that's not your normal, I'm just gonna do another one of these X, Y, Z, when you actually step out of your comfort zone, do something a little different, 
that's when you get creative and that's when something special happens. And, uh, and that's when you start contributing to the field of microsurgery. And this is a picture of me at one of the flop courses. And I can tell you, um, first of all, if you have an opportunity to teach a flop course, you know, you should be jumping at it. Uh, it's a chance to give back, but also it's a chance, you know, to teach in a very intimate setting and not everybody gets to do that. But as attending, uh, as a faculty of this course or any of these courses, you do, and I, I maybe do the same flap 10 times in a row over two days. And it's amazing how none of those flaps are exactly the same. They're all a little different. And, you know, so as go to table three, they've got great anatomy over there, you know, but it's, it's just the way it is. And you feel comfortable with that um, over time. So I felt like what would be good to do for this talk would be just to share sort of some of my one-off cases and just talk a little bit about what I learned uh, from each of those cases, because I think cases are interesting. This is one of the uh, first sort of challenging cases I had when I came on board at Duke. Um, they had a very aggressive uh, Mohs surgeon, and it was at the time where Mohs surgery hadn't really taken over a lot of the reconstructive stuff, but we had one guy at Duke who was doing a fair amount. And this lip uh, squamous cell carcinoma obviously ended up being a much larger uh, defect. Um, you can see taking the columella, taking the entire lip, uh, except for maybe commissure on the right. And I think the only reason that we even saw this case is because he ran into the bone in maxilla and the maxilla was positive. And I guess they hadn't they hadn't started teaching maxillectomies yet in dermatology school. So um, referred the patient over uh, to us uh, at the big hospital. And so we had uh, ENT do the maxillectomy and I did the reconstruction as I as I had learned uh, at Sloan Kettering, which you know, was radio form, which I still believe is probably one of the best flaps of lip reconstruction. Um, here's the design of that flap, shows you how old the case is, it looks kind of bluish, um, but you know, on the right side, uh, some uh, tissue for the columella. Never underestimate in the lip how much skin you need, not only to form the outer lip, but then also to form the inner lip. And that's often a miss uh, early on uh, when you're doing these reconstructions and not realize what you need for the height of the lip on the middle where the lip would be. And then now that the maxilla is gone, uh, there's a, a defect in the palate uh, to cover. So here's my reconstruction at the end of the case. You know, you use aesthetic subunits, little cheek advancement to get the scars where you want. Um, um, this was a free flap that was tunneled down to the facial vessels. And uh, here's his result. And that, you know, this is a, a very respectable uh, functional result. And, you know, and, during my time at Mass General, this would be a, a slap on the back and move on to the next case. And I think what I learned, uh, certainly at Sloan Kettering, and also being influenced by people like Julian Prebase when I was in Boston, people who would always do that little bit more, a little bit tweaks just to get things to look really good. This doesn't look great. And this is something that's going to be super noticeable. I had seen uh, Julian report a case once where he did a scalp flap for a mustache. So I thought, hey, that's a great idea. I should do that. So superficial temporal based flap. What's important in planning uh, is obviously to choose the hair that you want for the mustache, make sure it's obviously going in the right direction, pedicle length is going to be long enough, and the plan here would be to elevate the flap, make a subcutaneous tunnel, and then to remove that outer skin from the radial forearm flap and replace it with the scalp. And in this particular case, as I was elevating the flap, and once I got it down to the pedicle, uh, the flap looked pretty purple. And one of the things I did learn in my very conservative training at Mass General is how to delay things, you know, don't take chances. As soon as this thing goes under a tunnel and gets kinked, it's gonna have even worse blood supply. You're gonna be sacrificing your radio forearm flap. So I guess another key learning point is don't go ahead and take away uh, your recipient site for the flap until you're sure the flap's gonna be okay. So I just put this back up for a couple of days and then brought it back down and uh, ended up working out really well. Um, I was gonna tattoo his lip. I was gonna do something for the color on the lip. But one of the things I learned uh, over time doing a lot of head and neck cases is that skin that's by saliva all the time will have a natural pink color and this is you know and this is exponentially better than the result uh, that he had and it becomes very gratifying then so what did i learned from this case and so there's more than just to a reconstruction than just making someone functional and moving on that um, some of the best things and the fun things that we do are trying to recreate what looks natural and looks normal and that's the artistic side of our brains and it's why we became plastic surgeons and it's not only beneficial for the patient, you know, it actually is beneficial to you too. And expand your skill set as to not just, uh, you know, 
there's a lip defect, I do a radio forearm next, but what do I need to do to get this to look really, really good? Certainly, you know, there's time when having hair follicles is a huge problem, especially with head and neck reconstructions, and I've run into many of them, but at a time like this, scalp flap or submental flap or somewhere where you have hair bearing tissue can actually be really beneficial. And sadly, I've never done another scalp flap to do a mustache reconstruction. So relatively early in my career, this beautiful case, never really had a case to do another one. It seems, it seems a little strange. So that's a one-off. This is a 12-year-old boy uh, who had a uh, benign yet aggressive tumor of the nose and, and had this resected uh, finally by Mohs, and this was his final result. And uh, this is a kid who, at 12 years old, was very similar to uh, my son's age. And I knew how to do this reconstruction. I mean, I had learned from Gary Burgett about aesthetic subunits and how to do a forehead flap. And, and God, you see his results and they're just so beautiful. And just the thought of doing a forehead flap in this kid and having the family go through this and then ending up with like this lump on the nose and how many revisions just to get it good. And I can probably never get it as good as Gary. And, and something very fortuitous happened. So when this case came and we were talking about it, it was also during our 2007 flap course. And uh, the best thing about flap course is you get to hang out with some of the greats, people who uh, you've admired over the years and copy their work and, and become friends and realize people are just normal people and we all do what we do. And in this field of giants, surprisingly, uh, the person who became significant for me was this gentleman in front, Yixing Zhang. Uh, he was uh, from Shanghai, a young plastic surgeon who really nobody knew. Um, he was at Duke doing a one-year fellowship and had just arrived. He had maybe been there a month. And um, we had been talking about the case and you know, when he came, he didn't speak a lick of English. And he came up to me and he said, you know, you should think about doing a preauricular flap for this. And then I hadn't really know what a preauricular flap was. And uh, I'm saying, well, kind of described it. I said, can you show it to me in the lab? And the best thing about Duke is that we have all these cadavers. And so he went down into the cadaver lab and he showed me how he did uh, preauricular free flaps and said he had done six of them and that this might be a really good case for it. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought about having this pedicle and having to divide it and all the other nonsense that goes with forehead flaps, um, I actually approached the family. And this is what you can also do when you're in that second phase of your career and you're very comfortable uh, in your own skin is tell them, I have this idea. I have this idea for this flap. I have never done this before, but I think he's a good candidate for it. And I'd like to try it. And I had a very honest discussion with the family and, and they let the 12 year old decide and he was all in. He said, absolutely. And from my standpoint, of course, you know, always thinking what's plan B is like, well, worst comes to worst, I'll do a forehead flap, right? So, so we went ahead uh, to do the case. And so certainly using all the techniques and uh, thinking that we would use to do any regular nasal reconstruction, base it off the opposite side, get a sense of what the defect is. From the worm's eye view, you get a really good idea of how much lining is missing. And even in forehead flaps, this is where I think we often fall down in our nasal reconstructions, just not having adequate pining, focusing too much on the cover, there's cartilage missing. So again, this is a superficially uh, superficial temporal based flap. And so here's a design and you know, somebody, this is where, you know, someone had a eureka moment and looked at this part of the ear and said, this is exactly what we need to reconstruct the nose. Thin layer of skin, cartilage, and now you can do free flaps. There's a blood vessel that runs right through here. It's actually a very easy flap to dissect. Now, Yixing, who is more of a super microsurgeon, bases his uh, flaps mainly off the continuation of the superficial temporal vessels. So he would take a flap from the ipsilateral side and then and that do his anastomosis to the end of the angular vessels, so uh, below uh, one millimeter size vessels. Now, I I did microsurgery, but I was not doing any super microsurgery, uh, not in a case like this. So I did a more roundabout technique of taking the vessels more proximally so they were larger, and then deciding I would just use the facial uh, vessels or the neck vessels and do uh, some sort of loop or graft. And so here's the flap dissected. Um, like I said, easy dissection. You don't even see the vessels. You keep all the fatty tissue. I've got my superficial, superficial temporal vessels. And the other thing that Yixing said is that don't use uh, the saphenous vein or cephalic vein 
or an AV loop, you use an AV graft. And we had been started doing a fair amount of ALT flaps at the time, so I was familiar with the pedicle. I just had never thought of using it as an AV graft. And it made a lot of sense, especially in a young kid. It's going to give half this donor scar. I don't have to make as much scar. Um, the other thing that's nice, as we all know, when you feel comfortable dissecting this flap, easy to find this vessel, not a critical vessel, which is also really important. But if you need a bigger diameter, you just go more proximal and you can go all the way down as the vessels get smaller and smaller and almost match where you have to uh, reattach your vessels uh, at the superficial temporal uh, area. So, you know, it's, it's a great way to take a graft, went ahead and did that, made a tunnel, connected to the facial vessels, then connected to the flap and did the inset. And so this was the uh, final result on the table. And of course, there's still scars, but at least they're in areas where they're going to be uh, well hidden. Um, Jeff Marcus, who was my partner at the time at Duke, uh, who did beautiful ear reconstructions, uh, helped greatly in this case because I didn't even think for a second about what I was going to need to do about this uh, reconstruction. He took a, a contral cartilage graft and then did a little post auricular, like mastoid based flap and covered it. And um, I was thankful for that. And the kid did beautifully. And what I was shocked at, this was a couple weeks after surgery, was just how beautifully shaped the nose was already. Just knowing what a forehead flap looks like and knowing how many rev revisions you need to do. Other than you know being hidden from the sun and not having a lot of freckles on it, truly amazing. And what I think also is truly amazing is, you know, we have to be really careful about our donor sites. What a beautiful reconstruction of the ear. I think, you know, a lot of the board answers for this would be some sort of anti bush you know, advancement and changing the shape of the ear. But an app is absolutely spectacular. No one could tell that he had surgery. And this is a durable result that actually started to grow as he grew. And this is him at three years. You know, don't see any of the scars anymore. Told him he needs to get out in the sun a little more, get some sun damage uh, to the tip of his nose. But uh, other than that, absolutely a spectacular, one of my most beautiful nasal reconstructions of a nasal tip. I mean, you just don't show worm's eye views when you do forehead flaps for this type of nasal reconstruction because it never looks good. And you say, oh, no one looks up that way anyway. Spectacular. And this is the cool part about being in plastic surgery for a little while is that he actually showed up at my clinic eight years post-op. So he's gone from a 12 year old to this 20 year old giant and uh, looks amazing. Still needs to get more sun to his nose, but the nose grew uh, appropriately with his face, which is kind of cool. And I asked him, how's it been? Is everything okay? And he told me that he's like this huge kickboxer and he gets hit in the nose all the time and uh, hasn't been a problem for him. So. Very cool to see uh, these types of patients in follow-up. Uh, they really are indebted to you for what you've done. And uh, you're indebted to them for, for the experience of doing the case and having it done successfully. So for this case, what did I learn? You know, you have to be critical. Uh, there's getting on base, uh, but if you're not reviewing your cases and looking at your results and saying, God, does that really look as good as it possibly can? Or if you're seeing a Gary Burgett and you're seeing these amazing results, like what do I need to do to get there? because I can get there. And it's just a matter of uh, putting the energy into it and putting the time into it. There's just so much dogma, and especially coming out of fellowship. I mean, I did everything exactly the way that it was done in fellowship, you know, down to the pull sheet for the cases and, and how to do everything. It takes a few years to find your own way. And dogma is meant to be changed. So I would encourage you to try to expose yourself to new things and try different approaches. And things can get pretty boring if you're just doing the same thing over and over and over again. And I can tell you, the only way you're going to grow in the specialty is when you stop doing what you do all the time. You step outside your comfort zone and do something uh, that you haven't done and do something different. And you will grow. Sadly, this was a one-off for me. I have never done another preauricular flap as a free flap. Kind of sad. So, you know, probably as a result of uh, either Yuxing's poor English or my inability to understand what he was saying. Uh, he asked if we could write a paper together, and I was excited by that. I have like one case. He's like, oh, it's okay. He has over 60 cases, not six cases. So he, we wrote this article uh, together, 63, one of mine, 62 of his, of uh, nasal reconstruction using this flap. And also mentioned here uh, in the synopsis and in the paper about the lateral femoral uh, circumflex vessels, but that was kind of buried. 
The story doesn't end here though. So now the next year, 2008, of course, a really cool case. So I'm going to present it at the Duke flap course. Why not? You know, it's not a flap necessarily that we're teaching, but maybe we should. And of course, cast the characters. Uh, and whenever you see pictures like this and you see people sitting in front, they're the ones that kind of want all the attention, but the real microsurgeons are the ones that are all the way in back. Uh, this is Julian Prebase. Uh, Julian uh, was a regular at the course every other year or so. And uh, Julian, I admired so much when I was at Mass General and he was at Brigham. And of course, Mass General and the Brigham hated each other. The faculty never talked to each other. It was just this huge you know, rivalry. Um, but I always admired him, uh, not only for being such a gentleman, for being just a phenomenal plastic surgeon, consummate gentleman, and just everything you'd want to be in a plastic surgeon. And so I presented the case, and afterwards he kind of strolls up to me and says, you know, Mike, that AV graft is actually a flap. And I'm like, you know, Julian's up here somewhere in the stratosphere. I'm like, you know, what the hell is he talking about? And we're like, start talking about, listen, it's blood flow, there's flow within it. It's alive. And I was like, like, this is what every graft should be. Why do we have one tube going all the way down to a flap? It has to perfuse and then one tube going all the way back when you can actually have flow within the actual vessel supplying blood supply to your flap. And in fact, it changed the way that I dissected my free flaps. You know, I never, I stopped doing extensive separation of the artery and vein. I only separate the artery and vein now to do the vessels that I need to do because you want that interconnection because you want blood flow within there. I thought it was a, a, a unique idea that a lot of people just didn't know about. There's really nothing in the literature about it. And so I took the opportunity to say, hey, we should write this up. And he had about 20 cases over a 40 year career or so. And it was just such an honor to me uh, to be able to write a paper with a legend and someone who I looked up to so much. Uh, but talking about this vessel, is this a great idea? And why use a Navy loop when you can do this? Especially now so many people are doing ALT flaps. So what did I learn? Well, you can milk more than one paper out of a case, you know, and you got to do that early on in your academic careers. You got to start building your CV up. So don't settle for one. Uh, collaboration, you know, you can collaborate with other people uh, who share your ideas. They may have more experience, but it allows you to bring that kind of one-off case uh, into the daylight uh, in a wider audience so people can see it and learn from it. Uh, certainly to respect your and celebrate your elders, as I have gained a lot of gray hair myself now, I insist on this. And, uh, but really like, these are the people who have made it easy for us and made it seem like it's nothing out of the ordinary. And it's our job to push things along. Yes, uh, sadly, this great idea of the AV graft, I only did one more case using it. Uh, and, you know, that was over about a 15 year span. So it's not that I didn't want to, it's just whatever cases came along and when the Navy loop was just a, a better choice for me. So this is a case about planning and then throwing the plan away the minute you walk in the room. And this will happen to you a fair amount. This is a case of a chest fall cancer. So this is a woman who had breast cancer on the right. She was treated with a pedicle flap at an outside uh, plastic surgeon, actually from another state, um, had radiation, and then uh, a couple years after her radiation had developed this tumor, uh, which was actually a radiation-induced sarcoma. And it turns out, especially by the time she got to Duke, uh, this was a very rapidly growing aggressive tumor, was actually literally growing down the pedicle of the rectus flap itself. So uh, my philosophy on chest wall reconstruction, it's actually very simple. You can Take as big a whack if you want out of the chest. There are three flaps, rotational latissimus, external oblique flap rotational, and a vertical rectus rotational. You can take any two of those flaps and you can close almost anything. And then I've got the pictures to prove it, huge wax. So I kind of knew what I was gonna do in this case. And um, so we had the thoracic surgeons, they had some uh, GI surgeons as well. Here's the specimen. Uh, the left side of the specimen is the tram flap, that radiated tram flap. We see some of the skin from the belly wall also has been uh, resected. When you flip the specimen over, you get a better appreciation of the entire rib cage has been removed. A large part of the diaphragm has been removed. And certainly a large part of the skin uh, has been removed as well. And this is what you see when you walk in the room. Um, this is a pretty extensive uh, defect. Um, certainly, the entire rib cage on the side has been removed, and we're looking at uh, the lung, which is uh, 
uh, which is not being ventilated at the time. The diaphragm in this area is completely gone. We're looking at the liver. A large part of the abdominal wall is gone as they chase that muscle down to the belly. So latissimus slap is not available. There is no thoracodorsal system uh, in this uh, patient on this side anymore. External oblique is in the specimen on the back table. Uh, vertical rectus possibly can harvest it. You're just gonna you have another huge hole on the other side. It's not really gonna be very helpful. Um, so you need something. And so fortunately uh, at Duke, you work with wonderful uh, interspecialty teams. Uh, our thoracic guys, and our GI guys are great. So uh, around this era, everything was Gore-Tex. So uh, they did a Gore-Tex reconstruction of the chest wall, a Gore-Tex reconstruction of the diaphragm and a Gore-Tex reconstruction of the abdominal wall. So basically we had a huge area of Gore-Tex that just needed uh, vascularized coverage. I just needed the biggest amount of vascularized tissue I could find. And I flipped the patient. Uh, took the entire latissimus flap, took the entire serratus flap. Um, generally, that's more than enough to cover a very large area as a chimeric flap. Uh, the advantage, obviously, of having to only do one uh, anastomosis. In this case, it was not enough. Uh, got about two thirds uh, of the cortex covered. The entire kind of lower third uh, was not covered. Uh, so we opened up the uh, cortex and harvested the omentum the rotational omentum and did a little vest over pants uh, type uh, coverage here. So we doubled up the central portion. And then with good vascularized tissue, did the free flap to the IMA, which was uh, still available, was then able to just do a skin graft over this area. So a really hard, uh, difficult problem. We were able to use microsurgery to help get out of it uh, with a little help from a rotational flap. And remarkably, this patient did amazing. Never, never turned a hair, never had exposed cortex, never had issues with hernia, and uh, it's just an unbelievable uh, result that we worried about a lot and thinking, okay, what are we going to do when the flap fails or we've just got a hernia now or when there's cortex exposed? And uh, fortunately, never had to do anything. So what did I learn in this case? You know, you can say you expect to always expect the unexpected, but man, sometimes you're really just going to be shocked. And uh, I learned this, I learned this lesson probably most in head and neck surgery where I never ever actually started the flap uh, until they had done their resection because you would never know what these guys are going to do. Um, you can't really solve everything with one flap. I think there is this feeling like if I could find that one flap to do everything and I've done pretty big scapular flaps and flaps to try to do everything with one flap but sometimes you'll have a better result with two. Sometimes two flaps aren't enough and this is a great example of that. Um, having a great team, obviously, to make something like this successful, you know, not even having to focus on uh, the, the hernia aspect, the diaphragm, the chest wall, and getting great post-op care uh, in a thoracic ICU. And, you know, what we do is artistic. Uh, what we do is functional, but we also do things that save lives. And it's a really good feeling if you are allowing your oncologic surgeon to really have at it and do what they want. And we'll, don't worry, we'll figure out how to take care of getting things closed. Sadly, I've never done another case where I've needed three flaps uh, in one surgery to do a reconstruction. So, and that's kind of a good thing. Don't necessarily want a lot of those cases. Some cases you get uh, a little more attached to. Uh, this kid uh, came to me after um, a couple years of his Romberg's hemifacial atrophy had finally burned out. Uh, now a 16 year old kid. Uh, and you know how tough that can be at that age. Uh, and just how, you know, he was becoming a social recluse just because of people making fun of him. Um, fat grafting really wasn't as established at the time. Um, you know, I feel like I'm pretty good at fat grafting now. This is something where fat grafting probably isn't enough. Someone tried it and nothing worked. So they sent him to Duke and to me uh, for a free flap. Having, having trained uh, in uh, the New York area, uh, being influenced by John Siebert, who had an incredibly large series of doing scapular free flaps for this, um, this is kind of the flap I chose to do, uh, sort of my plan here of what needs to be done, where the skin will sit, where the, where the fascial extensions will sit. Um, if you haven't had the opportunity to do many scapula flaps, this is an amazing flap. Uh, given the obesity of the Americans, and this is an area where often flaps are super thin, it's just an easy flap to dissect to. It's just really hard to screw it up, defining the triangular space, and, and you're there, and so it's a fast dissection. The problem is it's on the back which is not super convenient. Um, for head and neck, it actually can be because I can do the entire case in the lateral. And so you can do your flap and get your vessels ready and do the flap and close and do everything together. So 
that's what we did for this case. Uh, my little uh, template for my green cow, um, some Doppler signals where uh, that circumflex vessel is, um, harvesting the flap. You know, now he almost looks like he needs bone. There's so much volume that's missing there and doing something more than just fat. So back's got this nice thick dermis as well, which is why I think John Siever liked it so much. You can also do fascial extensions. Nowadays, I think I would do more fat crafting probably in addition to this. This is like a nice matrix for that. But the goal was to get this to do uh, most of the work. Uh, this is a free flap that's attached to the facial vessels. This is him two months after his uh, procedure. And I was kind of proud of this case. He was uh, much happier. Um, definitely felt like the left side was maybe a little bigger still. Um, certainly had something going on under the eyes and pulling down to the eye where that was probably a lack of just supportive tissue. Did do one small touch up for him uh, about a year after the surgery, some liposuction and did a little bit of fat grafting. Uh, don't really know how much it helped. He pretty much uh, disappeared after that, although he did contact me about three years later. He was in Chicago starting a family, asked him to send me some pictures. And so the, the pictures are kind of dark, um, but um, I was pretty impressed how things had held up over time. This is now three years out. Um, certainly things that I would want to touch up, but you know he wasn't in the area and, and wasn't really interested in having more surgery. And wouldn't you know it, this year calls the office, uh, finds me, I'm out of Duke. He's got some questions for me, something about hardware, this or that. And I'm like, just curious, I gotta know what he looks like, I gotta know. And it's like, can you just send me some pictures? Do you mind just sending a picture of yourself? And so I took this picture on his phone and I just like had this moment where I just like, I just felt so good that, wow, this has turned out amazing for this kid. And I had felt so badly for him when he was a 16 year old. And now some almost 10 years later, he's got a family, it looks pretty good. And uh, I was like, this is a, an amazing case. And this is sometimes the issue with plastic surgery is that we have such delayed gratification. Um, we had a big practice in facial reanimation, you know, putting flaps up and then you're kind of waiting, waiting, waiting to see what the result is, you know, and for this, you know, to get satisfaction almost 10 years later was kind of cool. So what did I learn uh, in this case is that, you know, it's all about how it looks. And a lot of what we do, uh, we talk about replacing like with like, you know, it almost goes back to the whole argument is should you do esophageal reconstruction with jejunum, which is like tissue, or should you do an ALT because the voice is better, you know, and it's, it's that kind of discussion, but you shouldn't necessarily, you know, close yourself off to other ideas, uh, especially uh, if it's not like tissue. And, you know, the biggest bugaboo in, in plastic surgery is that we're artists, but the medium we're working with is tissue and scar tissue, ages over time. You don't know what you are going to get from swelling over time and scarring, and you're not gonna know how things age over time. And I would venture to guess that that photograph that he sent me was probably taken at a sort of pinnacle, the best time that this was ever gonna look, and he looked amazing. And I almost guarantee you, if we get a picture of him 10 years from now, things are gonna have changed. It's completely different on each side. And, you know, and that's just the way it is, you know? So a lot of times you're looking at photographs or pictures of people who are doing reconstructive surgeries or things, and they look amazing, but like they're still post-op swelling or they're a year out or, you know, they're 10 years out and the scars have faded and they've gained weight and all these other things have happened. So I appreciate that. I am sad to say that I had never done another scapular flap for Romberg's disease after that case. And I kind of, in putting this together, kind of chuckled to myself because it's like, man, when you only do one of something and it turns out, you seem like the smartest guy. I'd be like, man, that guy is in. He's like great at Ron Burke's cases, you know? And man, if you started doing 10 of those or 20 of those, I think uh, you would be learning a lot more and you'd be a lot more humbled. But, uh, you know, these are one-offs, right? So and I, and I share it with you. Speaking of emotional attachments, uh, this is a guy uh, who, I think I saw a lot of these cases uh, when I was at Duke because they had a very aggressive thoracic service. He had had a esclamous cell, radiation, recurrence. So he had had, you know, part of his lung removed, had this uh, closed space abscess, then this closed space wound. And, you know, these are the type of cases where, you know, patients will have a pneumonectomy and the thoracic service will send you the case and they'll say, I'll just do some free flaps and fill this fill this hole up. And it's this cavernous, it's like, it's the entire hemithorax. Like there are no flaps that do that. And they're really hard cases because they're so heavily irradiated. And especially something like this, where it's like, it's in the middle of the back. 
like there's no there's no latissimus to just flip into here and this is tissue and you've all experienced this this stuff is rock hard radiated tissue and you can see from the ruler it's like 11 centimeters deep and so these are cases generally that get sent out with bag of dressings and you know things will heal over time or the patients will pass or something but this guy there's something about this guy resonated with me we were exactly the same age and you know he was very very much athletic before all this happened to him. He loved scuba diving. He loved being out on the beach. And this particular wound just prevented him from doing the things that he loved so much. And the other thing that was heart-wrenching for me was and his beautiful wife. And you know, we became friends over time. But when I met him, that like it was her responsibility to take care of this. And this thing smelled. And she had to change the dressings multiple times a day. And I'm like, you know, we need to figure out something. And so I couldn't use anything local for him. And I said, I'm gonna do a free flap for this guy and I'm gonna to try to fill this with some vascularized tissue and we try to get this thing to heal. So my plan for him was to go to the other side uh, where the latissimus was available because again, I need a whole bunch of tissue. The latissimus is a big flap. And I'll plan it in a way that I can, after I do my anastomosis, I can duck most of the muscle in and I'll still have a little skin paddle uh, to help close uh, the skin in this area here uh, rather than trying a skin graft or something like that. The problem, of course, is you know where are you going to do your vessels to? Uh, Axel is not really that uh, comfortable uh, for me in this type of case, going through all that radiated tissue. What I opted to do for him was to do an AV loop uh, from anterior neck, where I was comfortable with the vessels, uh, and ended up hooking up his AV loop to the external carotid and to uh, EJ, and lay the loop in the neck, and then flip him over and you know debride the wound and expose and, and get the loop and then kind of make a decision. Are we gonna go ahead? Um, I always had done AV uh, loops and free flaps right away. Um, I know a lot of people like to let them live for a while so they know that they're intact. But if you're comfortable with the micro, and once you've done micro for a while, I think it's very safe to do that. Opened up, found the loop, it looked perfect. Went ahead, dissected the flap, um, did the microscopic anastomosis, uh, flap looked great, took all this muscle after doing the debridement stuff this thing in there, uh, close the skin, and uh, kept my fingers crossed that uh, that everything was going to be okay. Uh, again, worst case scenario, he ends up with a wound that he had already. And, uh, you know, fortunately, he actually did really, really well. Um, certainly, his wife was happy because she no longer had to do these crazy dressing changes. And after a little adjustment and limiting his activity for a while, making sure that this thing really had grown in well, um, you can see he started getting in really good shape again. He bulked up quite a bit. Um, the, certainly the non-radiated tissue helps that area heal. He was able to get back to what he loved the most. Sent me this picture from Hawaii where he took his family and did scuba diving and just like one of these really feel good type stories. And I think we had built a special uh, relationship and uh, it just felt so good to be able to help him. And it's not a case I normally honestly would have would have even tried to tackle. Um, but I think it's just that emotional attachment. And it was super sad uh, to hear about a year and a half later that he had passed uh, from recurrent disease. But uh, super, super nice guy. And I can definitely see myself in him. So in a case like that, what can you possibly learn? Well, you know, we're, our patients are human beings, you know, and I think we can look at pictures and decide what we would do or wouldn't do. But sometimes you extend yourself. And, you know, we're human too. And you have to be careful of that because that emotional attachment can get you into trouble. Certainly we've all uh, seen cases or maybe personally been involved with cases where we ended up getting into some type of reconstruction that we probably shouldn't have even started. So, you know, there's no question that our specialty, you are doing things that are out there or new or things maybe just to help people that you can cause a lot of problems, you know, and, uh, and patients can be worse off after what we've done. And that's the hardest thing possibly, the most better pill you can take. But, but I tell you again that until you step out of your comfort zone, you know, you're not going to grow. And, and that's where the magic happens. That's where the amazing things happen. And uh, you discover new things and can share new things. And uh, never needed to do another back reconstruction with a free flap. So it was, it was a one-off for me and uh, just not a case that we see very much, um, honestly, working with Scott Levin, Scott got a lot of these referrals and, you know, for Scott to do a free fibula to the aorta uh, on a case that has instrumentation in the spine uh, was just like a daily case. And uh, my cojones are just not as big as Scott's. Uh, so we talked about one-offs. 
um, just some fun cases to sort of sink your teeth into. So where's the joy part? Well, you get a certain confidence uh, that you really can do almost anything. You know, you have the tools and that's amazing to have a job where you can help people stimulate your mind and use your hands to go in and actually fix a problem is a really special thing. I've always tell everybody the best part about uh, being uh, a plastic surgeon is living vicariously through our patients. You know, I think we work super, super hard. If you're a microsurgeon, especially if you're at an academic uh, facility, you know, we're just operating all the time and you got to really cherish the time that you spend with your patients um, because there's a whole life going on out there and we're giving up some of that by, by working so hard and committing to ourselves. But if you can have a job like this where you can be creative and you can sort of scratch that itch in your brain and think of something you know that someone maybe hasn't done before of course the irony is the irony is that almost everything's been done before you know it's just that you know about it so it's kind of like hey i thought of it too but um you know to think of something different to do different things and probably the most gratifying is just to be able to teach others um fellows and residents like you you know because someone was kind enough to do that for us and we are also relying on you to take what we have learned and now in your career advance it and do amazing things and there's no better joy for us you know you have the opportunity to teach um you know you should you should jump at it uh it's, it's incredibly rewarding and it's been certainly some of the most satisfying things i've done in my professional career the other fun part about microsurgery is it is really small and there is a great camaraderie um, this is, uh, and I'm glad Ming Wei is here. Ming Wei, there you are, my friend. Um, you know, we all, what we all do is very intense. Uh, we all do it a little differently in different places, but when we're together, no one can really appreciate each other more uh, than other microsurgeons. And as you can imagine, after a full day of teaching like a Duke flap course, um, coming to my house for dinner is just a, an incredible time. A lot of drinking, a lot of tall tales and uh, just a lot of fun and all realizing how special we really, how lucky we are to be able to do what we do. So I have a couple of final, final thoughts for you. I'll play old dad on this. So, so what's the final thoughts for one-offs? Well, like you never know it's a one-off, right? I mean, it's just something new. The cool thing about them is that they are really pushing you to think differently, that you're sweating it out, that what you planned on doing failed and you have to get creative and good things will come. And you'll know it's a cool one-off when you drive home and to yourself, you're like, holy shit, I can't believe that I just did that. Like, that's so amazing. And you'll go home and like, it's hard to tell your spouse or your kids because they don't really understand that. And then at night, it's really hard to sleep because you're like, okay, like all the things, all the bad things that are gonna happen now. And because we've lived through all these things, it's like the phone's gonna ring and it's gonna be, the signal's done, they're bleeding. I can't get a pinprick out of the flap. You know, you name it, whatever. You can transfer it to the ICU with a heart attack. I mean, these are all things that I've seen, it's crazy. And then of course you wake up in the morning and there hasn't been a call and you don't even feel like eating breakfast. You actually can get in your car, you get to work, you're gonna see that patient, you're gonna go in early and you just have to see for yourself. You see the flap, it's pink, everything looks good and you're like, okay, I'm gonna go get a cup of coffee. Everything's gonna be okay. So I'll share some final thoughts on just my career, personally, in microsurgery. What's amazing in a career is just how random, like the cases that you get to do are. Like these are one-offs because that second, third, fourth case never came. And in some cases it might be intentional, you're choosing not to do them. In some cases it's just, it's just the way that it is because it's where you're located. And what's also amazing is that it could be the beginning of something really cool. And in fact, it could be your thing. You know your first transgender case and suddenly like you're the you're the person who is like who does most of this and innovates most of this and so again stepping out of your comfort zone doing something different is how these things happen and i never really think of microsurgery as a case you know what you're doing today oh, i've got a micro case it's it's not a case okay it's just a tool and it really becomes like that it's just your way of getting things done and the cool thing is that like the entire body is now you know your sort of plaything you can take whatever you want from anywhere as long as you can get it to live as long as the donor site's okay 
and you can do that to, to do a reconstruction. And that's really, really cool. And if you think all the flaps that have ever been described are done, you're wrong. And if you think about it, and this is what I learned really from studying anatomy and doing a lot of the ICG studies uh, that we did at Duke, is that every case is really a one-off, if you think about it. There's no two cases, no two anatomies that are gonna be the same. And when I go in and I, it's a perforator case, like to me, it almost doesn't matter that there's a CT angio. I understand the comfort in having it. You know, I know the vessels are there. It's just my job to do a dissection and find them. And you get really good at that. And sometimes you find you don't need technology as much. And think about it, you know, if you had, and you know this is from the different people you work with, that same patient going to any other plastic surgeon, the result's gonna be different. And it doesn't mean that one's better than the other. I mean, we can judge as to what's better, what's not better, but they're successful cases. So what you do really is individual, and that case really is a unique case. And the only thing I would urge you is that as you get started and as you're doing these cases, is to really document your case as well and then be critical. Make sure you're reviewing, looking at your cases. And for really cool cases or something you do different, take the time to write stuff down. Keep a little journal, keep a little notebook, because that next case may not be for four years or may not be for seven years. You know, I remember I had to do a trapezius flap and I was like, God, the last time I did a trapezius flap, I, I had to pull out my own book and read the chapter because it had been so long. So some final thoughts on your career as fellows, uh, residents getting started. Well, you know, from my standpoint and from the teaching staff standpoint, all of you are one-offs. You know, you're all completely different when you show up, you have different education, different experience, different upbringing by your parents, technical skills are a little different. And, you know, there's never gonna be a, another resident or fellow that's like you. And what you bring to the table is truly unique. And, you know, as the program director for so long at Duke, you know, we would have our meetings and we talk about who's the best resident, who's great, who's not great, and maybe complain about some of the problems we were having. And I'll tell them all the time, it's easy. It's so easy to teach people who are like super skilled and really good. You know, where we have to dig in is for people who are struggling a little bit because everybody can do this. It's a matter of uh, just really committing to it. And I would tell you, embrace these challenges, these really challenging cases and don't settle, seek out excellence. It's okay if you make mistakes. We all have, you know, it just looks like uh, when you're with your your faculty at the Bunky Clinic, everything goes so smoothly and everything. Yeah, but that's after years and years of, of really figuring this stuff out. And the problem is we just can't teach all that stuff to you. You have to figure out your own way and figure out your own path, which is the really cool part about plastic surgery. I mean, I think about like people with chipping out gallbladders or stuff like that. I feel kind of sorry for them, you know, because what we do is just really so special and it's artistic. And I want you to, that's the one thought I want you to leave with it. It is artistic. And what I love about the Bunky Clinic, man, you got a bunch of real artists there. I have to show this, Rudy. This is uh, when Rudy was invited to come to the faculty of Duke Flap course, uh, 2011. This is R Rudy's artwork. And it is just blew me away. It's amazing. And uh, to this day, I'm still blown away by this. This is uh, incredibly creative. And, and obviously Rudy's artwork uh, in his flap uh, design, uh, his website that people use all the time for doing flap cases uh, are just a way of giving back. And it's a way to show that we have this artistic expression. And I certainly would be remiss if I didn't mention um, Greg Switch, uh, Switchway Nixon. Uh, I remember when you gave me the CD and I told you it's like, it's in my computer somewhere. And when I play random songs and, and one of your songs come up, I still think about you and smile. But um, you're surrounded by some incredibly talented people who happen to also be incredibly uh, talented surgeons. So um, just thank you guys so much uh, for inviting me. I definitely am taking you up on coming. I have a whole bunch of witnesses that you offered. And so it's going to happen. But uh, Greg, uh, Rudy, uh, Babak, uh, Andrew, and Walter, thank you guys so much. Uh, what you do is amazing. The Bunky Clinic. Uh, it's just an amazing place. It really is the birthplace of microsurgery and just an incredible honor uh, for me to be part of this. So thank you. Mike, thank you so much for um, honestly one of the most inspiring talks that I, I've seen in our field. I think uh, this, um, and I can definitely tell you that any resident or fellow or other, other surgeons in general who are going to watch this are going to be very inspired by it. So thank you so much for that. Awesome. Really, uh, It's definitely one of the best talks that we've certainly had as part of this series. And and that's saying a lot considering how many great talks we have had. So thank you so much for that.
You are so welcome. I think, I think you you bring up so many so many great points. We can probably talk about this, uh, you know, for for hours. Um, but uh, I think one of the one of the thoughts I I had when you were showing some of these cases, especially the ones that were pretty early in your career. Um, you know, there's always some component of fear, obviously, especially as you're kind of a younger surgeon trying to embark on something new. And the question is always, you know, how do you deal with that fear, right? Now, you know, I, I've always thought that, you know, a healthy level of fear is always a good thing um, because you kind of need to, you know, make sure that you're, you know, dotting your I's and crossing your T's. Um, my question for you is, you know, how, what kind of word of advice do you have or words of advice do you have for the residents and fellows out who are going to be embarking on a practice of their own about how to de deal with the, the the fear of taking on a big project, especially as a new attending. There's no question uh, that your first case out of out of your training and probably your hundredth case out of your training that the nerves are there, uh, the fear of failure is there, um, especially in big cases and. You know, you have to figure out how you're going to deal with that. Um, the analogy that I would use, Bobak, is, you know, like it's, we give a lot of lectures and we do a lot of public speaking. And, you know, to stand up in front of a group of your colleagues and there's like 800 or 1,000 people, it's just so intimidating. And I can tell you for me personally, you know, I'm an introvert. People are shocked when they hear that. I mean, I'm totally an introvert. And it's it's something that you just need to learn to channel that energy and realize, first of all, yes, I have this nervous energy, but like, I'm going to take that energy now and I'm going to apply it to the, the case that I'm doing. And I think that, you know, I'm trying to imagine a time when I ever walk into a case where you don't have that little bit of excitement. I think maybe as you go further in your career, it becomes just excitement or you feel that butterflies in your stomach or you feel that sort of that tingling sensation, which when you're younger, you interpret as fear, you now are interpreting as, okay, let's do this. You know, let's like, let's, let's get our A game on. Let's make sure we're not missing anything. We're not doing anything. And, um, you know, all these things are learned things. You know, I think that the, some of the most rewarding teaching experiences I've had, I think in residents are the ones who are just always a little afraid, you know, because you just want to push them. It's like, okay, just go, just cut a little bit more, do a little bit more. All of those uh, people end up being great plastic surgeons. You know, you have that confidence to know, listen, you know, there's some people who are just like all in, boom, you know, and that's their style. And there's probably something that's not great about that either. But, you know, I think just that gentle reassuring that you are no different than anybody else. You're a human being, like you're going to feel nervous before you present in front of their group. You're going to feel nervous before a case, but you got to focus and you'll be able to channel that. I think we all kind of do that in our own way. You know whether we do it, you know, subconsciously or just consciously. Yeah, those are all <clears throat> very good points. Uh, I see that uh, Professor Mingwei Chang has turned his webcam on. I didn't know if he had a question or not. So Mingwei, let me know if you have a question. Um, it looks like I'll... he's still driving. Stop driving, yeah. Mingwei. I told you to pull over. <laughs> yeah, I think he's parked. Uh, uh, you're on mute right now, Mingwei. You may want to unmute yourself. Well, there you go. Bye. Thank you so much. It's a great talk. Very inspiring. I enjoy it very much. So, Thank you, my so much uh, amazing cases. Really appreciate. It. Thank you. And I have in my office, I have a photograph for patients that I actually do surgery. I have a picture of Mingwei and I sitting doing microsurgery together. Yeah. Again, you I also mute have your, one. Yeah, mute your mute your phone for a second. And it's a picture of us operating, and it's one of the joys of having such a small community and sharing thoughts and visiting people and being able to sit at a table with you and to do a surgical case was just amazing. And I always show the picture, and I always tell them in the middle of the case, you know, the light started swinging, and I was like, what is going on? And they're like, oh, it's just an earthquake. And I was like, <laughs> what? I'm like, oh, that... he's like, Mike, happened all the time. You know, we go back, it's like, now imagine doing a micro case. During an earthquake, and, and I was like, no big deal, you know, give me another 11 0, no problem. So, I see you every day, my brother, and uh, love you very much. Yeah, you are my hero. <laughs> I also have the same copy of the picture to get a uh, hang in my office. I look at you every day. Too. Ah, well, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Well, I've, I've had the uh, privilege of operating at um, Changgung as well. And fortunately, we did not have an earthquake when I was operating there. So so I have to just count my step, blessings there. Step out of your comfort zone. Like, okay. Yeah. I'll operate in a couple of earthquakes. Okay. And then we'll talk. I, I, I have had some earthquakes here in San, in San Francisco, though. But uh, 
True but that. the other question, I had a couple of other questions and comments for you. Um, I think one of the things that you mentioned and you alluded to during uh, some of these you know, really challenging cases was the importance of mentorship and collaboration. Clearly, when you started your practice, especially when you were at Duke, obviously, you know, Scott Levin was there. You mentioned Julian Privas at, um, at, in, the, in the Harvard system, even beyond, you know, your years uh, at, at, at MGH was someone who you would kind of run things by and so on. And obviously, collaboration with Yixin Zhang with uh, the auricular flap. Um, I think that, you know, that that is such an important point that you that you made, because I think really the only way to grow as a surgeon is, is to have uh, mentors around. And I know that for myself, when I started practice, I think, you know, you know, there's always going to be that case that comes in that you just need to get people who have more experience than you to have a look at it. And and having Greg and Rudy around um, who are in our offices are all right next to each other. And we always do, you know, we have rounds and indications conference and so on. And, you know, you actually learn a lot more as an attending than you do as a resident or a fellow. So I think those are all really, really important. Yeah, the thing I would say is that, and, and I think this is a really important point, you know, when I started at UNC, I was by myself. There literally were no other microsurgeons. And it was a desert. I mean, you're literally on an island. There was no one really to do that with. And it was a huge, huge change for me when I got to Duke. I never even realized, but like Scott was the only one doing microsurgery at the time when he brought me over. Um, you know, some of the microsurgeons who were there had left, but just to have somebody to talk about and to throw cases by and stuff changed everything. And what I would say to your fellows and residents is that's on you. You have people who you could easily reach out to and you have to build that support of people who you consider mentors. And we love hearing from you. And there's no shame in asking a question like you, because I was very much like, at Mass General, you did your second year, you're by yourself. And so I kind of knew what that was like already. And it was like a pride thing. Like, I'm going to get this done. I'm not going to ask people. I'm not, gonna, and that's just stupid. You know, mm -hmm. it's just, there's things that you're going to, there's mistakes you're going to make and things you're going to learn, but you really don't have to be by yourself. And in this day and age, with <laughs> so easy to get in touch with people and send pictures and ask questions. Um, I would, it's, it's shame on you if you don't, you know, and that's part of your fellowship is building those relationships and part of your residency is building those relationships. And, and you meet people at meetings who will come up to you and then they'll, they don't have mentors, but they'll want to reach out to you. And I have people who send me the cases all the time, you know, and it's like, I just want to check this. I want to run this by you. And you know, something that's great. We, we actually enjoy that. We love it. Yeah. I think those are really great points. And, and, and I think um, all residents and fellows are finishing up. I think they'll, um, they should take this point to heart for sure, because I think it really makes you grow as a surgeon for sure. Um, I had a, um, a kind of a comment and, and then a question to follow that. Um, you have um, worn many hats during your career. I think we and we've we've seen that as as part of this talk and as part of the introduction. Um, you know that of an academician, uh, an educator, obviously with the flap courses and with your residents and fellows, um, as a business leader. Um, working with industry, for example, on new technologies, um, uh, and you know, in private practice, for for example, a different hat. Um, and so, obviously, you've been able to recognize opportunities when they come along. And so, um, I was wondering if you have any thoughts or advice um, to young surgeons out there, as far as I'm sure that if somebody asked you 25 years ago, you know. What if you would be working with, you know, an international company developing new technologies, or if you would be, you know, a leading best case, best save at ASRM and so on, you probably wouldn't have really had an idea. So clearly you, you were very open to, to a lot of these opportunities. And so do you have any kind of thoughts or advice on, on, on how to really recognize opportunities and take advantage of them? It's, it's such a great question. And there's so many different aspects to it. I think the, the, best advice I think that I would give people is you need to know yourself. There's so much of he's doing that and she's doing that. And, and, and it's like, you have to decide what's important to you because maybe, you know, taking time away from practice and being like a, a chief medical officer of a medical device company, like, like maybe this is not in your DNA or maybe it's just not something that's interesting to you. And I couldn't have imagined, because uh, I did that, I couldn't imagine that that's something that I would want to do. I think my biggest problem, my wife knows this really well, is that I just feel like I just get bored. 
I feel like I do some things for a certain number of years and it's like, and then like, I just need something else. In fact, you mentioned getting an MBA. So I was like the only 50 year old in the MBA class going back and getting their MBA. And, um, you know, and a lot of people on this call have their MBAs, you included. And I think that, you know, people may say, oh, I got to get an MBA. Like, for why? Like, what is it? What is that? What is it tickling for you that you think maybe this is something that I should do? And I think because of that sort of boredom and not knowing what to do, you know, I have always kind of been on the academic track. And I was like, well, if I'm going to be a chief of plastic surgery or if I'm going to run a hospital or do something, I'm a great surgeon. I have no, no experience, you know, running and running organizations and running things. And so, and so I saw the MBA as a way of like, here's a great way for me to get some of that experience and then do that. And like many things, you do something and it just changes the way you look at the world. And I think you do have to have a certain self-awareness that this is something that's actually interesting. I, I need to explore this or, you know, like how many more deep flaps do I need to do? And who am I doing them for at this point? And, and there's all these questions. And I think, you know, as you go through life, you'll be thinking about different things. I will say certainly residents and fellows at this point, you got one job, get a job and start doing cases. It is too early in your career, I think, to be worrying about these types of things, honestly. And I tell people who I've trained that spend the first four or five years just perfecting your craft and get really good at it, you know, and to, to sidetrack and get an MBA or sidetrack and do something, it's just going to, I feel, and this is just my personal opinion, will limit uh, the arc of your career. And um, yeah, and uh, sometimes we don't understand. When I left uh, Duke to go into prior practice, you know, people were scratching their heads, but you know something, you're not doing things for other people. You're doing them because you know you and you, and it's fulfilling some sort of need that you have. And and I'm also have this, uh, I'm really lucky that I never look back on things or regret things. I kind of, once I make a decision, I'm just full on. I don't ever really look back and think about it. And it can be very helpful sometimes when you're doing surgery, because once you make that cut, you can't really put it back. You know, you got to be able to keep pushing your head and moving on. So it's probably, right. it's probably a characteristic that a lot of us have. Right. Well, I think those are uh, really great points, really inspiring thoughts. And and I wanted to thank you again for taking the time, especially um, at a late hour, East Coast time, um, to honor us with your talk. I, I'm really looking forward to um, uh, putting this one up and Rudy will have it up by tomorrow. So I'll, I'll certainly awesome. uh, send, you a, send you a link. And as I mentioned, um, we we absolutely will have you here in person. Uh, uh, COVID I'm excited for that. <laughs> That's right. We will hug regardless. Exactly. Maybe exactly. with N95 masks on, but we will hug. <laughs> we will have fun. Excellent. Yeah. And, Thanks and, again, and I, would offer, and I would extend to anybody, you know, anybody who is looking to talk or need advice or things like that, you know, you can reach out to, to myself, certainly people like me, because, you know, that's what we enjoy the most, you know, and uh, we've made a lot of mistakes along the way. And so it's, sometimes it's nice to learn from the mistakes of others. So, but thank you again, Bobby. Great. Thanks, Mike. Have a great night and uh, hope to see you soon in person. Absolutely. Thank you, Mike. Bye. My brother, take care.